You need to try meditation. No offense, but meditation is for white folks. Say less, Black King. My only question is, why was this movie even made? Then I looked at who was responsible for this mediocre display of cinema, and the answer is clear as day. This guy. Kenya Barris, and I'm not surprised. This man is obsessed with race relations and depicting them in his movies. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy some of his work like Girls Trip and uh, Girls Trip. Oh, Blackish. Yeah, Blackish. I like Blackish. Uh, Shaft was alright, but I digress. In most cases, he shows how blacks and whites view themselves as well as how they view each other and how they should embrace one another. Good message, but usually a lackluster execution. And White Men Can't Jump is the perfect example of that. By the way, there will be some spoilers, so if you haven't watched the movie yet, just put your volume down and keep the video up. I need the views. Cuz motivated today, I see. Wait, you guys are all cousins? <laughs> As usual, we're gonna start off with the bright spots. The cinematography was very good. I like when movies take place in California, specifically LA. Obviously, a lot of movies are shot in LA, but not a lot of them make LA a character. The filmmakers took full advantage of the California sun and the lighting of Imani and Kamal was great. Their skin tone was vibrant and not under or overexposed during the interior scenes. Speedy and Renzo were the comic reliefs and did a great job delivering the comedy. Vince Staples is naturally funny so his presence alone steals the show and Miles Bullock just feeds off that and gives us a great laugh along the way. I feel as though a lot of young comedians nowadays don't translate well in TV shows and movies. They seem to try very hard to be funny whereas two non-comedians like Miles Bullock and Vince Staples do it effortlessly. Maybe it's because they understand their roles and what it pertains versus forcing their lines and presence with extra theatrics. We're in the year of our lord 2023. The stigma of white men not having hops is a thing of the past, and I'm glad this movie addresses that. In the original movie, Woody Harrelson's character literally couldn't dunk the damn ball, hence the title. That was the kind of thinking back in the 90s. Nowadays, we have white athletes jumping out the gym, so that phrase is no longer relevant. What they did in this movie was take Jack Harlow's character's legs away from him by restricting his ability to jump. The restriction? He tore both of his ACLs. So I did appreciate the forward thinking for his character Jeremy. Not sticking to the reputation of old, but finding a new reason to name this movie White Men Can't Jump. The title still doesn't make sense, but I'm not going to give them too much for it. This game is win by two. Not here, it's not. One of my biggest gripes with this movie is that there was entirely too much music being played throughout the runtime. The number of songs in this movie is absolutely ridiculous. A song plays when they walk in the building. A song plays when we are introduced to a character. A song plays when there's a new scene. A song plays when we get to the park. Then it stops for a couple lines of dialogue just for it to start back up to show us the tournament. The song choices didn't make it any better. Don't get it twisted, the songs were good, but I wouldn't have chosen those specific songs for this movie. These weren't background score music, these were vocalized songs. There's even a scene where Jeremy plays Shape of You by Ed Sheeran for Sinqua Walls' character Kamal outside of his car and the music is loud as fuck even when they're talking. All the music takes away from the movie itself. A lot of monumental moments in movies at least have a score in the background playing to add to the importance of a scene. This movie didn't have that and those redemption moments and reconciliation moments lacked the impact due to the lack of score and the subpar acting. What made the original movie a classic was that the lead actors could you know not saying that Sinqua Walls isn't a great actor or that I wasn't impressed with Jack Harlow's performance, but they didn't convince me that they were desperate. Their circumstances were serious, but they didn't put on a performance that made me believe that this was a do or die situation. Kamal was moping around because he blew his chance at going pro due to his arrest in high school. 
he didn't have a lot of confidence in himself because he let that period in his life shape his adulthood. I don't want to see my main character doubting himself throughout the whole movie, but yet I want to see him have confidence to overcome a direct obstacle. The consistent self-loathing is a real downer. Jeremy is this health guru who trains slash coaches aspiring ball players. He eats plants and drinks healthy potions and water type stuff in hopes it will help his ACL heal so he can have a shot in the NBA or the G League. He seems slightly incompetent yet somewhat wise in his approach to whatever obstacles were in his way. He utilized his strengths and hid his weaknesses. This movie really tried to portray him as a man child but that wasn't the case. He was just ambitious to the point where he was stuck in life, not realizing that he was holding himself and his girlfriend back from moving forward. Just like Sinqua Walls, outside of the circumstances of the situation, Jack Harlow doesn't make me believe that his character was desperate. Anytime there was a moment of seriousness, it was cut short with a last minute gag. I can't take you serious if you're not going to take you serious. There were a few things in this movie that I either thought didn't make any sense or was very odd. Like Jeremy having beef with this other white trainer who is popular on social media. Upon their first meeting, he is hostile out of nowhere and feels threatened. This imaginary beef helps lead to him and Kamal losing the first tournament that they played in. I can understand why he was jealous, but why was he so hostile to someone that he doesn't even know or have any real competition with. Another head turner was Amani giving her husband Kamal $5,000 to help him enter the big tournament. That $5,000 was for her hair salon in which she had been saving up for. I understand standing behind your man and supporting his dreams, but giving up your savings for a secure future for your family is a bit wild. If he would have lost the tournament, especially in the fashion that he lost the first one, they would have been back in South Central struggling even more. But at least his confidence was restored, right? And what about when they won the tournament? Imani basically tells Kamal that his dad has died while he was playing. After he hears this news, we don't see a teardrop from this man's face. But moments later, we see him and the team smiling and happy that they won $500,000. Like, are you not going to go check on your father, sir? Overall, this movie was below average at best. We're in the era of rapid remakes. Hollywood has completely ran out of ideas that will captivate an audience, so they depend on nostalgia to draw eyes to their projects. These remakes don't do the originals any justice. They use the titles for marketing purposes, then proceed to strip the joy and emotion that the original had and create this lifeless piece of cinema. The best thing about this movie is that it's better than Space Jam and the House Party remake. With that being said, White Men Can't Jump 2023 is just something good to visually look at. Something that you put on the TV when you're going to sleep. Nothing special. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this film. Does Hollywood need to stop with the remakes or do you enjoy them? How good of a job did you think Tiana Taylor did? Me personally, I think she did pretty good. Was this movie better than you expected? Put your thoughts down in the comments. While you're at it, like and subscribe to the channel. I'll catch y'all next time. Y'all be easy.